the topic for ours, which is given the security environment, what exactly is it that we ought to be aiming for in terms of the prospects for a federated approach or a series of federated approaches? And I could not ask for three better panelists to join me today. Um, we're going to run this a little differently than the first panel. They are not going to be making opening statements, per se. This is more of a conversation. Um, but let me introduce all three of them at the beginning, and then uh, we'll get going with the conversation and, of course, leave time at the end for, for all of you to ask questions. Let me begin to my immediate uh, right with Dr. Matt Spence, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Middle East Policy. And you can imagine he's very busy these days, so we're grateful that he was able to take time out of his schedule um, to be here with us. Matt serves as the Principal Advisor to Secretary of Defense Hagel and Under Secretary of Defense for Policy Christine Wormuth um, on uh, the security aspects of the region, which includes oversight for security cooperation, and specifically that also includes, of course, foreign military sales. Um, Dr. Spence previously served on the NSC staff in a, a couple of variety of positions, I guess I would say, and also on President-elect Obama's NSC transition team. And uh, notably, he's a co-founder of the Truman National Security Project. Next to Matt, we have Christian Brose. Chris is the Principal National Security Advisor to Senator John McCain. He was previously a Senior Editor at Foreign Policy Magazine, where he helped create the Shadow Government blog, which continues to this day. And he was a chief speechwriter for Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and a speechwriter for Secretary of State Colin Powell. And uh, all the way uh, to my right, I have Tom Vecchiola, who is the president for International Business for Raytheon. Uh, Tom has been with Raytheon since 2002. He previously served as principal advisor for national security to Senator Olympia Snow. There's a theme here for principal principal advisors, I think. Um, and he's served for 22 years in the U.S. Navy, retiring as a captain. So um, thank you, all three of you, for being here today. Again, I think you each bring a really important perspective, the administration, the Congress, loyal opposition in Congress as well, and of course, industry. Um, but I want to begin first with Matt. And Matt, I think the question on the minds of everyone after listening to that first panel, which really ran through the number of enduring security challenges, state and non-state based, is whether there's, uh, you've seen a real interest and willingness uh, in there being a collaborative approach to security cooperation in the region. We all have heard and have, many of us have lived through concerns about lack of trust, whether it's between um, uh, uh, Arab states and Israel, whether it's uh, among the Arab states themselves, whether it's about working with the U.S. and working with one another. What do you think the prospects are for um, greater involvement in security cooperation and what we like to call federated defense in the Middle East? Yeah, well, first, Kath, thanks very much for the opportunity to, uh, to talk about this. I think, uh, as you know, working on closer cooperation with the Gulf states, particularly in the region, has been a top priority of Secretary Hagel. I think something I've been spending a lot of time on, actually looking around the room, I know there are people uh, in the room here who really played a key constructive role, both serving within the government when you were here and also with our partners elsewhere. I, I think that the main point is I think there is, a, there is an appetite, and it's an appetite where I think you need to look very deliberately about starting in the right areas and the right issues and have the right type of patience and calibrate your ambitions given the realities of the region. And let me just give a sense of the flavor of, I think, what Secretary Hagel's been doing about this. I think starting uh, a year ago, uh, Secretary Hagel gave us a direction to really look at some long-term projects we could take about working for closer Gulf interaction. And there's really been an arc of things that, that the Secretary has directed us to do. Last year at the UN General Assembly, Secretary Hagel and Secretary Kerry co-chaired the Gulf uh, Strategic Cooperation Forum. It was a meeting of all the Gulf foreign ministers at the same time to really talk about two things. Not only just what are the wolves at the door, the key issues, but what are the longer term issues that we can start working together for interoperability and cooperation to try to get ahead of. With the explicit recognition that it's a long term project, but unless we start now to try to build some of these platforms, uh, we aren't gonna make the progress we need. Secretary Hagel then went out to Bahrain in December, gave uh, a policy address about the Middle East uh, policy, then went on to Saudi, in UAE with the purpose of continuing to have these very high-level conversations with other leaders about the important role the United States saw this playing. And then he proposed hosting a meeting of the GCC defense ministers, which he convened in Jeddah in May. It was the first time a U.S. Secretary of Defense had had such a meeting in over five years with their counterparts. 
And his logic was, if he is meeting with his NATO counterparts two or three times a year, given all that's going on, this was an important role for the United States to play. And then finally, uh, the, the wrap-up has been last week on Thursday, I attended with Secretary uh, Kerry chairing another meeting of the Strategic Cooperation Forum, which really was in the context of what we're doing with ISIL, but also talked about some of the important cooperation we're still trying to build. And, and we can talk about it more, but I would throw out three areas that I think are ripe for greater cooperation. Uh, to answer your question, Kath, of what is their appetite for? And I think those three are ones that are collective action issues, but they're good collective action reasons we should be acting together, just given sheer geography and the nature of the goods. And those three are first, maritime security, uh, second, integrated air and missile defense, and third, cy cybersecurity. And I think we can talk about them more as, as things unfold, but the one thing I would say for maritime security, to take one example, is people in this room know well, if the Strait of Hormuz were closed, or if there were issues there, it poses a common problem to the United States and to the other countries in the region. And next month, we're gonna have the largest uh, international countermine uh, maritime exercise ever in history. Those are the types of things that we need to start by building the slow and steady work of finding common interests, look at capabilities that these countries can add, and continue to have these conversations in addition to what we're doing with the immediate needs of countering ISIL, Syria, Iraq, and those other types of issues. Great, thanks very much. Um, Chris, w what is your sense uh, from your time on the Hill and in working with um, staff and members ac across the board about how the risks and rewards are viewed in terms of security cooperation in the Middle East? We obviously had, for instance, in the case of Egypt um, most recently, or I think that's the most recent example I can think of, um, an issue arise around whether or not there was a coup there, what the conditionality ought to be that links to U.S. security assistance. A lot of those um, decisions have been made up on the Hill in terms of st um, statutory guidance. What's your sense about how Congress um, views security cooperation in the Middle East and the U.S. in particular in, in its role as leading the right sets of behavior um, for the region? Sure. Thanks, Kath. Um, yeah, I think what I would say, first of all, in terms of how the Hill thinks about this, you know, I think the place where we should start is just a recognition that when we talk about sort of the congressional view of, you know, security cooperation in the Middle East, particularly on arms sales, we're talking about a very small number of people uh, on the Hill who are really tracking this closely uh, in terms of specific sales, specific capabilities, you know, what to whom, et cetera. And, you know, look, I'm not even sure I would necessarily, you know, uh, count myself among that, that elite group who are really looking at this in, in a level of granularity. Um, what I would say more broadly is, you know, I think what, what your average member of Congress, when he gets or she gets involved in these sorts of issues or looks at them, you know, typically it's coming from the perspective of, you know, one, uh, there's a local equity involved. You know, there's a state or a district uh, equity. You know, uh, there's a Raytheon plant in my state or there's a, uh, a Boeing plant in my district. You know, second, uh, perhaps it's a special interest. I mean, Israel, obviously, but also there were Kurdish uh, concerns with uh, F-16 and Apache sales to Egypt. Um, you know, other concerns with regard to, you know, Egypt, or uh, I'm sorry, to Iraq, um, you know, other concerns with Egypt, as you mentioned. Uh, you know, and then finally, it's the sort of broad spectrum of human rights concerns. Um, and, and I think from these three different vantage points is typically how uh, Congress will engage on these issues. Um, so I think you can look at it and say that Congress is sort of a limited actor to a certain extent, um, or there may be limitations for sort of strategic action on the part of Congress. That being said, I also think uh, you know, Congress actually has uh, and has played uh, a really significant role in terms of the strategic shaping, I guess I would call it, of the environment, because there are limitations on, on all of the other actors as well. I mean, from uh, the foreign partner standpoint, uh, it's not exactly been the historical track record that our foreign partners have been uh, always purchasing capabilities that they need to advance sort of strategic challenges uh, or, or to respond to strategic challenges that they have. Uh, you know, in industry, I think there's always going to be a desire to sell. Um, you know, there's rarely going to be a time where industry will say, no, we really would prefer you not buy this particular capability from us because it doesn't really aggregate into a federated defense concept. And I think with the executive branch as well, I mean, there's the limitation on strategic action because they too are managing these relationships. Uh, and they have a uh, desire to be responsive to partners who are being helpful in other areas. Uh, you know, there may be a degree of clientitis, and then there's always the pressure of, well, if we don't do it, someone else will. 
and that'll limit our influence and we'd be better off uh, providing a capability even if it's not necessarily sort of fitting into a concept of collective action or collective security because we'd be better off uh, having the influence and the business and the things that come along with that. You know, and I think where Congress can fit into this is, is from the strategic standpoint. You know, because you have uh, a relatively small number of people who are really thinking and focusing on this, you have more flexibility and more uh, ability uh, to really think about this from a strategic vantage point rather than sort of falling down into the seams that may affect you know, the other stakeholders. Uh, and I think that you've seen that. You've seen you know, Congress uh, provide the President with authority to uh, do a lot of the good missile defense cooperation uh, and exercising that they're doing currently um, you know, in terms of shaping the environment for how uh, the administration is thinking about uh, responding to these different sets of actors and how these capabilities integrate together. Uh, you know, I think there's a real, ch a real opportunity if Congress is thinking about this you know, from the federated defense perspective of not how we can tell the administration or industry how to do their business, uh, but how to sort of set limitations and how to uh, provide a certain degree of guidance about you know, what we would hope to see uh, in terms of leadership and knitting together these countries into something that looks like uh, you know, a, a collection of partners capable of strategic and, and cooperative action. So, Tom, for you, as we look strategically from the vantage point of uh, the U.S. government at how to create capabilities we think are important in the region, at the, at the end of that pointy spear comes industry, and um, you certainly are at that vantage point having the international business side for Raytheon to think about the, you know, the way in which you can talk to customers um, in the region to try to drive them to solutions that seem to make sense for national security. But you're also at the end of all these um, various constraints, if you will, that um, exist in terms of your ability to operate, uh, to, 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 to be able to make sales in the region. Can you talk a little bit from, how, how, does, how do you think industry sort of views this world of security cooperation, its role in it, and the willingness of both partner nations and the U.S. government to work with industry to find solutions? Well, well first off, thanks, Kath, for the opportunity to, to provide an industry perspective in the dialogue. And uh, it, so it's a great question. Um, cause um, I think industry views itself, and, and certainly I view myself as an enabler of uh, our, our foreign policy and, and defense policies. Uh, we create the opportunity for uh, close collaboration from a, from, a, from a military perspective. And uh, if you look at capacity building as a building block for uh, a federated defense or towards greater interoperability, uh, you know, I think that's where we start at. Uh, and so we start with uh, shared uh, uh, common equipment, shared training. Um, if we look at integrated air defense as, as an example for, um, of, of where this works, uh, U.S. forces were significantly deployed in, uh, in, the, in the Gulf for decades with U.S. equipment. Uh, now that equipment is being sold under, uh, under FMS cases, for example, in, in many of the GCC countries. Uh, those uh, international partners are being trained in the United States, um, so we now have the the, the capability to rely on them from a, from a common defense perspective. Uh, there are integrated architectures that are being developed for shared information across the GCC. There's already uh, systems in place, for example, for situ situational awareness from an, from an air perspective where, where they're controlling their, their air environment. Uh, common architecture to provide it to all the GCC countries with uh, Dis discrete applications within each country, but again, that's, uh, that's shared uh, operational uh, perspective is, is there. And um, we have to work very closely with state and, and defense and, and the Hill on the release of and transfer of technologies. But, but that's, I think, all very workable within uh, uh, the constraints of, of, the, of the policy decisions that get made that we, uh, again, help enable uh, from that perspective. I'm going to come back to Matt. There's something that um, Chris said that very much resonates with the question I was planning to tee up for you, which is, you know, it's very difficult to be purely strategic when it comes to um, convincing sovereign nations, you know, for whom, the, who do not report to the United States to develop the kinds of capabilities that the U.S. might believe are in their best interest. So can you explain a little bit about how you are approaching this issue of 
you know, you mentioned, for instance, countermine, the countermine exercise, which I think from a U.S. perspective is an incredibly important capability set, yet is not as um, maybe as appealing to some countries as flying, um, you know, advanced fifth generation aircraft as an example. How do you approach this issue of um, the U.S. having particular capabilities it wants to grow in the region, and the region and countries in the region have their own ideas about what makes sense for their security? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, and, and I think you're right. I mean, these are conversations that happen in partnership, and that's the only way that'll, that'll work. I think what we try to do, and pretty deliberately, is to start with the strategic framework uh, about what the nature of the threats are. So let me give you an example. Uh, in Jeddah in May, Secretary Hagel started the conversation by bringing in General Austin. So rather than going right to a conversation about what are the capabilities, what are the advanced fighter aircraft, what are precision munitions, what are other things, let's first start with a conversation about how we each see the region. And it was very deliberately to, to start with the issue of what are the near-term threats that we have, and those are the threats that we read about in the headlines that should be no surprise to anyone here, but also what are the longer-term threats that we really need to start the hard work now together, because if we don't build the capabilities five, ten more years out, those are really what are going to get the issues for us. And I think what we try to do is if you start from that perspective, ideally, and I, and I say ideally, that is from which you get a conversation, but what are the capabilities that we need together? And there are two types of capabilities. There are capabilities which the United States can bring unique assets uh, to bring to bear, which that is the place will always be. There are issues that we need to be working on together, and there are issues that it just does not make sense for either the United States to provide the sole assets or for countries to acquire their assets on their own. And one of those, for example, is integrated air and missile defense. Recognizing where the political integration of the GCC is right now, we just want to take some basic steps to make sure that we are not closing any doors. So we aren't at a place to have uh, interoperability to full spectrum right now, and the GCC is a, its own entity, and we will encourage, but the GCC and these leaders of the sovereign countries make their own decisions as they should. What we feel like we can play an enabling role is, let us not make decisions on purchasing that will close doors. So as our cooperation evolves at the appropriate pace, we will allow them to do more. So it's an intended to be a two-part conversation, and one that evolves. You know, for example, uh, Admiral Miller, the head of NAVSENT, has conversations with his NAVSENT counterparts. General Hesterman, uh, the head of ABSENT in uh, Central Command, meets regularly with the air and air defense chiefs to have these very types of conversations with you. And that's things that we're trying to encourage to make sure that you have an operational on one side, but informed by the strategic capability side on the other. That's great. And, and Chris, I think one of the things people think of when they think about issues of um, helping the U.S., helping allies and partners, they think about burden sharing and they think about the U.S. maybe spending too much time and energy and certainly resources in trying to provide foreign assistance, um, whether it's, you know, uh, in, in any kind of form, but particularly um, the security assistance. <clears throat> how, do you, how do you set forward a, a, a positive way of framing the issue of helping allies and partners, and in this case in the Middle East where there's so much turmoil, there's, I think uh, the American public maybe has um, less familiarity with the various actors and, and the level of non-state and state-based threats that exist. What is the convincing case that can be made to the American people for investing ourselves in this area given concerns about um, the U.S. spending too much abroad? Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Um, you know, look, I think that the, uh, you know, sort of what we're watching unfold right now with ISIL is, is a very helpful example, you know, that people turn on their television and they don't just see American airplanes in the sky, uh, they also see uh, coalition partner airplanes. And, you know, I think you can extend this to other counterterrorism threats and you can certainly make the argument when it comes to, uh, you know, other strategic challenges in the region that we're better off having partners that are capable, uh, who are able to operate together with us uh, who we have, you know, a degree of familiarity with and a degree of influence with uh, so that we can pursue common objectives and it's not just falling on the United States uh, at the end of the day. Now, that being said, I mean, I think we also need to be honest about the role that the United States is still going to have to play here. I mean, I don't really think that uh, any of this cooperation is going to be possible without us. I mean, you have uh, a series of countries who 
uh, you know, don't exactly have well-established patterns of dialogue and cooperation. And, and we're right now, I think, sort of playing the integrating role, you know, whether, uh, you know, it's missile defense, as Matt put it, or, you know, the, the air operations in, uh, in, in Iraq and Syria right now. I mean, I think it's uh, something that, that, that the Congress is going to have to continue to remember as we look at questions of budget, et cetera, that more capable partners doesn't mean that you know, we can ratchet back on what we're doing, on what we're spending, et cetera, because you know, we're enabling them and we're enabling the kind of cooperation between them that we'd like to see. And without us, uh, it, it, I don't I currently think that it's possible. This is going to be you know, uh, a real long-term challenge for us. And uh, coming back to something that Matt said, Tom, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on any promising areas or certainly any areas that concern you where you've seen the, um, the, the actors in the region evolve in their willingness to cooperate with one another, to work with the U.S. Um, on growing capabilities. Are there either capability areas or shifts in attitude more generally that you would point to as indicating that prospects are either better or worse than they may have been, say, five to ten years ago with regard to cooperating yeah, on security? Thanks, uh, thanks Kathy. So there, there's two aspects, I think, that I'd like to address in this. So one is, is every country is a little bit unique. They have different uh, internal demands and, and requirements. Um, and if we look at Saudi as an example, there's 100,000 Saudi students in the United States every year for education, advanced education. When they graduate, they go back and they're looking for jobs. So one of the unique uh, aspects uh, in dealing with Saudi, for example, is it goes beyond just providing them equipment and training, but it, but it also creates the opportunity for, for production of equipment in Saudi, development of, of, of uh, new equipment in Saudi, and again, that cooperative approach, which is significantly enhanced over the years. And that's where, again, our partnership with the government, U.S. government, and, and our um, partner government uh, plays a big role because we, we do uh, want to create this industrial base because, again, it's, it's good for their diversifying their economy. It's, it's great for uh, employment uh, because of the high unemployment that they're experiencing. Uh, let's face it, it they're all not going to be in, uh, you know, in, in oil and gas forever. Uh, and so they, there is a significant interest uh, by the, the current uh, uh, leadership in Saudi to, to help develop it. And we can, again, from an industrial perspective, help build that uh, capability. Um, the other aspect is we are seeing uh, shifts uh, with, within uh, GCC countries as they realign their procurements and buying uh, more towards um, U.S. capabilities. Um, if we use uh, Guitar as an example, um, they mostly bought European and very recently over the last year, year and a half, have made significant investments in, in U.S. technologies, U.S. capabilities. And uh, again, I think that's a shift uh, from uh, their, pri their prior uh, buying habits. And I th think that has, goes a long way to, um, uh, to demonstrate the, you know, where the administration has worked very diligently with many of these countries with regard to the, the bilateral relationships between, between our two nations. So I think those are two examples of different but uh, exemplars of, of, of the shifts that we're seeing over the last couple of years. <clears throat> that last comment from Tom makes me think about the changes in, in the arms market overall where you have, frankly, much more competitive international arms market. There are other places these countries can go than the U.S. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the U.S. can at times seem to be difficult um, because we are principled. Um, so for both Chris and Matt in, in that order, if, if you don't mind, can we talk a bit about the, you know, the, the areas that come into play, whether it's the human rights point that came up earlier, um, uh, uh, adherence to norms such as missile technology control regime, other um, issues that arise that cause us to uh, pause in sales and consider them in ways that maybe other actors in the international marketplace wouldn't, and how we think about that for the future. You know, how do we, how do we position ourselves um, to maintain the qualitative edge that we want for the United States and its allies, um, but also to make sure that uh, our sales are able to be made um, in regions where we may have some concerns about those issues. So let me start with Chris. Sure, thanks. Um, 
you know, I think that our, you know, we, we certainly hear this from our, uh, our foreign partners, you know, how frustrating the process is, all of the other bells and whistles that come along with it. Um, you know, the, the, the simple reality is it's just not going to change. You know, um, members of Congress are going to continue to have concerns, uh, whether it's parochial, whether it's human rights. Um, and these are things that, you know, will continue to make Matt's life difficult. Um, but it, look, I also think that it provides uh, leverage of a kind. Um, you know, I think having the Hill there uh, to sort of play a bad cop role to some extent allows the administration to get into a gap with a foreign uh, country that we may be having challenges with. Um, and it, it creates a little bit of uh, diplomatic space for them. Um, the other thing, though, I would say, uh, you know, is we, we can't, um, you know, we, we, we can't underestimate or rather overestimate the amount of leverage that we, that we have here. And I think this is something that, you know, the Hill has consistently seen. You know, we think we provide all the security cooperation, uh, security assistance. Uh, we sell uh, and, and authorize the sale of, you know, billions of dollars worth of technology. And we think that that provides us uh, a healthy degree of leverage and influence. And I think certainly what I've seen is that uh, it's far more limited than most people assume. Uh, it's far harder to wield than most people assume, and particularly to get to your point about the increasingly competitive international market. You know, when you have uh, partners who can very credibly say, well, if you won't provide me this, I'll go, you know, acquire it from country X. Uh, you know, you very quickly run into an argument, you know, from uh, the congressional standpoint, uh, which is, look, are we better off uh, moving forward with this despite concerns and continuing to uh, retain some degree of influence and connectivity, uh, you know, or do we really believe that us saying no is ultimately going to shut down the concern that we have? And I think that, you know, I think increasingly over the past few years, the answer to that has been, you know, it's simply not. Um, the one final point that I'd make, though, is I think, you know, certainly the argument that we make uh, to foreign countries, and I'm sure the administration and industry does as well, uh, you know, it's, it's not just the particular capability that the country is acquiring. You know, so when they are, you know, gnashing their teeth about all the process that they have to go through and all the concerns that they get from the Congress, you know, what they're also getting beyond uh, a particular capability is, you know, the unique enabling capability that comes with working with the U.S. military. Uh, the ability of the United States to help them form connectivity with, with regional partners that, you know, perhaps uh, hasn't really existed. Uh, you know, so that's something that I think is a unique sort of exceptional role that the United States can play that, you know, the Russias and the Chinas and, and, and other sort of uh, potential arms sellers, you know, uh, just, just can't do right now um, and hopefully will not do. No, I think, I think, Chris, you hit on exactly some of the, the key things we're trying to do. I mean, I, I would just add two things. I think, first, the way that I approach this and that we've tried to do very deliberately is make sure that this is an ongoing conversation with the key stakeholders. So if you look around this room, the key people are here. There's uh, an executive branch piece, there's a foreign government piece, there's a key congressional piece, and there's an industry piece. And I think we've tried to move us away from the come and ask for approval right when the big sale happens. You know, then you have a big lead up that people aren't informed and there's, and there's a lot of coordination rather than this is an ongoing dialogue. I mean, their countries are not, individual, are not interested in buying the F-16 or the F-15, they are, but they're interested in providing a platform and a relationship that allows them to take forward against their concerns. And that should be an ongoing conversation that is happening as much when we seek uh, Gulf contributions in the ISIL airstrikes as when there is something relatively downturn. Uh, when there is not as much on our front plates, and we need to make sure that we have the discipline to continue that conversation, which we try to do. Uh, and, and I think the other piece is, is especially in this incredibly competitive environment, and I know I feel it, I'm sure you feel it much more being, being out there on the front lines as well. Um, you know, I'm in the region about a week a month, and having these conversations, and the, the reason why we talk about why these capabilities are important are not, as Chris said, the actual platform themselves. You know, there's a reason when you buy some of the most sophisticated military weaponry that the world has created, you have a training component, a maintenance component, a tail that ties your countries together. And I think from our perspective, the virtue is to have Saudi pilot pilots training with American pilots, UAE pilots training with some of the best American fighter pilots. Doing those types of things build the relationships that we need because it's not the reason why these countries have these capabilities is we don't envision individual countries really necessarily 
off on their own action. The reason we want to do this is when there's a shared threat, as there is with ISA, which happened in the last month, that we are ready to actually take action together, which we can. And those are the types of things we're trying to do. So, so there's an enormous economic benefit for selling this type of American equipment to the Gulf allies, but I see it as much more a strategic partnership. And I think that's something that people in this room probably understand well, but I think that's part of the story that is often missed, which I think we can emphasize more. It's like, when we want to have partners and we want to act as partners, you need to do steps and do things years before to make that possible. And if we don't do it, it's just not possible when we need our friends and partners most. <clears throat> Matt, I'm going to ask you um, a question that hasn't come up. It didn't come up much in the first panel either, but, but for anyone who works in this region on this issue set, it is the literal elephant in the room, and that is Israel. Um, t talk to me a little bit about how you think the U.S.-Israeli relationship has evolved in a way that either has help to facilitate more cooperation. So for instance, you mentioned earlier the strategic cooperation forum that the GCC has. We have these venues now where the U.S. is very clearly working with actors other than Israel to grow security uh, capability, and yet that has to be, I imagine, a concern for Israel. How have the U.S. and Israel progressed in their relationship to make these advances possible elsewhere in the region? No, I think I think that's a great question, and and one of the concerns that I think about much. You know, we have uh, at the Defense Department, the Biden administration, a very deep and intense security and military dialogue with the Israelis, as you know. You know, I think as I was tying up, I think I've been to Israel 25 times since tasting, uh, since I've been in this position, and I think at a variety of levels, at much more senior levels and at operational military levels, that conversation continues, and it's for a reason that. There's a commitment both written to congressional law, but that uh, the administration believes strongly is to make sure that we take steps to protect Israel's qualitative military edge, you know, that Israel's able to ably defend itself against the significant threats in the region. One example I think about, you asked of what we do to it, I think is the, is, uh, the weapons deal which resulted in the sale of precision-guided standoff weapons to UAE and Saudi, as well as uh, advanced Ospreys, as well as other munitions to Israel. Um, it was very deliberate strategically that that came in partnership. And I think what happened is there was a shared strategic sense that there are threats that both Saudi and UAE as well as Israel faced in the region. That it made sense for both countries to be capable to work in partnership with U.S. coalition operations. And rather than seeing this as a one-off trade-off, we try to see it as, as a sense of rising the security capabilities of all countries. So last year, the United States gave Israel more FMF than ever in U.S. history. And by releasing some of these even more advanced capabilities to Israel to increase Israel's capability to deal with its, uh, its enemies, I think gave the confidence in the Israeli government to, uh, to allow the support of the provision of additional capabilities to other partners, which then could be used in coalition operations. So it's a key part of what we're doing, but I think in a sense now is if you look and have these types of conversations, to look for strategic opportunities where it's in both countries' interest to have the capabilities to participate in joint operations with the United States. Chris, I'll open that up if you want to comment on just sort of the congressional viewpoint on, on Israeli capability and the relative, you know, attention that's paid to that in terms of these other deals that may be made. There we go. Just to uh, make one point quickly, you know, I think that <clears throat> the, the pace of the increase of our security cooperation with the, with the uh, Gulf countries um, has begun to change how Congress thinks about QME. And I think um, increasingly, you know, there's the question of what people are calling sort of collective QME. You know, that when QME is evaluated, uh, it's sort of on a sale-by-sale -sale basis. Will this affect the relative countries, um, you know, military balance vis-a-vis -vis Israel? And I think as uh, sort of collective capabilities grow, um, I think Congress is increasingly interested to have regular assessments of how particular arms sales security cooperation fits into uh, you know, the possibility of sort of a collective uh, QME assessment. And you know, it's something that is uh, currently in legislation that's uh, pending within the Senate. Um, and I don't think the idea is to limit the security cooperation that we're doing with the Gulf partners. And I think that the Israelis would probably uh, be the first to say that they want the United States to have that uh, connectivity because of the influence and uh, the leverage that it does provide, limited though it is. 
but I think we also need to sort of step back, particularly in the sort of environment of uncertainty that we're living in, in the sense of, you know, who knows what five years will bring here, uh, to be looking not just in sort of, you know, stovepipes of, you know, uh, one-off sale-to-sale bilateral uh, QME questions, but, you know, looking collectively at the capabilities that are out there in the region and how that may affect uh, the security balance of Israel. I want to switch now um, into the set of um, capabilities that we think are most promising. It came up a little bit in the last panel. I think Nora Benzahel did a nice job of, of starting us down that path, and um, uh, Matt has brought a few up here. So, Tom, let me let me begin with you. Are there particular issue areas? Obviously, you're not an, an unbiased source from given uh, that you'll um, have particular areas that are important to Raytheon. But are there areas as you go out and talk to um, folks in the region that, that you think they look to U.S. industry in, or the U.S. in general in particular for? Um, and can you describe some of the attributes that they're really looking, the capability areas or attributes that they're looking to the U.S. for? Uh, yes. Um, so I think in, in general, you know, when I'm meeting with our international customers, and this is really at the, at the Minister of Defense level and, and the Chief of Staff levels, um, they clearly see the, the, the U.S. relationship as extraordinarily valuable to them. They are investing, and, they, and they'll tell you up front, you know, they are investing in their defense. And, and most of them will, will be up front and say, we're investing in, in our defense because we are concerned about our neighborhood, right? They're concerned about what's happening outside their borders, even though they're, you know, obviously focused within their borders for, the, for their national security perspective. So uh, they also want to be, uh, you know, have that bilateral relationship with our with, with our military. So, com common equipment, things like common situational awareness, um, uh, common C2 command and control systems, uh, interoperability of platforms, uh, whether they be jets or or weapons. Um, we mentioned earlier about integrated air and missile defense and uh, the commonality of equipment, whether it's a you know a THAAD system or a Patriot system, um, but you know, those, those capabilities that, uh, again, provide that defensive shield. Um, um, Matt mentioned um, maritime and uh, maritime situational awareness. Um, if you look at uh, the GCC countries, uh, uh, Saudi, Qatar, the Emirates specifically, most of their natural resources, most, most of their revenue generation is offshore, right? So significant interest in uh, protecting uh, those areas, um, you know, it would be a, a, a vision to have all of that uh, from a connectivity perspective, have those all tied together, but right now they're, they're very stovepiped. Um, and, and actually uh, the military, most of the militaries aren't investing in, uh, in those areas. That's actually uh, in investments are being made by the uh, oil and gas companies there. And then finally, another uh, high interest item is cyber and uh, protecting their networks and their commercial infrastructures. And, uh, and that's a significant demand signal as well. And uh, they see the U.S. being very responsive and forward-leaning in cyber and uh, them wanting to take advantage of, of those capabilities as well. And Matt, you mentioned cyber as well. Can you talk a little bit about the types of cooperation or um, you know, uh, the approaches that you're hearing most often, um, and I'm assuming this is largely the Gulf states, but beyond that, if it's coming up more broadly. Yeah, it was, it was a, cyber was a significant part of the discussion at the GCC Defense Ministerial. And, and, it's, and it's an important thing to do because in, in both our system and other countries' systems, cyber is not exclusive in the purview of the defense ministries, nor should it be. The types of things that we want to encourage, though, is, is to start both the conversation at the DOD levels, but also at the interagency levels. So one were discussions about uh, what increasingly we can do for cyber defenses. That's a significant issue. Lessons learned from what we have, uh, what we can do, what we can talk about uh, for them. And I think that is the sense of the type of thing that we're trying to get ahead of, that we're both, both very focused on the issue. Something happens in a country in the Gulf. Uh, it impacts us in a very direct way, of course. So, that's one of the, the significant issues. And then I think I would agree with everything Tom said as we look towards the capabilities on maritime and air missile defense in the, in the future. It's looking for those issues where if you just look at geography or just the nature of the threat, it just makes sense to work together. 
And if you lay out the strategic case, it actually isn't that, that hard. So, so that's what we're trying to start with. And then from that, we can work what specific capabilities, work the approval processes, work the technological transfer issues. But at least starting the issue and taking a step back, if we could design a system, where does it just make sense to we, for us to be working together? Because the nature of the threats just don't stop at a border. What's one last question, then we'll open it up to the audience. And so, Chris, you get the, the last question from me, which is we've, we've focused most of this conversation, um, you know, perhaps partially by intent, but I think just by the nature of the, the way the world is right now on the Gulf and the higher end, if you will, capability sets that are desired in the Gulf. But there are other parts of the Middle East, um, <clears throat> and certainly the greater Middle East to include North Africa, where there may be lesser, uh, qualitatively lesser, um, more, less complex types of military capabilities that we might seek to have with our partners and allies, and, and in that space, you get into this area of the responsibility of the Defense Department versus the responsibility of the State Department and others, the authorities that we have, the roles of uh, ministries of defense versus ministries of interior. And I wonder if you can just say a word about um, how we think about that issue space. CT is certainly inside, much of CT is inside that issue space where we have prescribed authorities for defense and state and others, but there's a lot of, um, I think it's fair to say, a, a a, a, a general feeling that we have not maximized our U.S. capability in those areas. So I, I welcome your thoughts on that. No, thanks. Uh, look, it's a great question, and I think it's something that the Hill has uh, paid a lot of attention to, but you know, frankly, needs to pay more attention to. And you know, what we've seen over the past several years is the sort of so-called proliferation of authorities. You know that. Uh, security cooperation wasn't moving quick enough, so 1206 was created, 1206 was not moving quick enough, 1208 was created. Uh, you know, there's frustration with all of these different authorities, so the Global Security Contingency Fund was created. Um, and I think, look, I think we're at a point where uh, these sorts of challenges of, you know, whether it's training irregular forces, training uh, counterterrorism partners, whether it's MOD, MOI, uh, you know, I think we need to do a hard scrub of uh, what this has all been getting us, because I think we've seen on a number of instances there have been you know, very good success stories of cooperation and capacity building, um, but there have been a lot of instances, um, some instances that we're seeing now, uh, where this just hasn't really added up to what we'd wanted. Um, is that an authorities problem? Is it a local capacity problem? Um, you know, are there lessons learned from our experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan that we can be bringing to this? You know, I think this is something that, you know, the Hill needs to be doing, uh, you know, even more oversight on. I mean, the one final point that I'd make, somewhat related, uh, not to go back to the sort of high-end capability question, but the extent to which I think we're providing, you know, um, the priorities that, that, that Matt and Tom have identified on the defense side, I think, are correct. Um, they're also sort of more purely defensive in nature. I mean, when we get into the offensive side, um, I think it's, it's trickier and harder. Uh, it requires more thought. Um, but it also, I think, is something that we need to think through in terms of you know, something you raised about uh, autonomy of action. And you know, we, we provide these capabilities, but we also want to have influence over how they're used. And I think a lot of that comes down to the confidence level that these countries have in us. Um, and I don't want this to be a partisan comment, but I think there's some concern about whether uh, that's there right now. And when you look at instances, you know, outside of the, uh, you know, the, the, the Middle East itself, um, you know, the, the event that happened in Libya that media reports suggest, you know, one of our Gulf partners was involved in, you know, we're providing these capabilities to countries for use in, you know, certain domains, and we want to cooperate with them, and we want to build collective action capacity. Uh, in certain areas, but we're also empowering them through that very process to act on their own where they believe their national interests are concerned. Uh, there will be times, I think, where that will uh, dovetail with ours, but there will also be times where we're essentially enabling them to act autonomously. And if they don't have the confidence in us and sort of our approach to the region, uh, I think we're creating an incentive for them to do it with the very systems that we're providing. And actually, I think it's that's a fair point to make across the spectrum of, of uh, from from training, if you will, down at the lower end all the way up to high end capabilities. That's a concern. Okay, let me open it up to the audience. And just as John had asked you in the first panel, um, I ask that you state your name, your affiliation, and make it an actual question. Um, and one, please, as you raise your hand. So, 
Holy cow, we've answered every possible question you have. That's amazing. Yes. Hi, thank you for your comments today. Melissa Dalton from CSIS. Um, I was wondering if the panel could comment on the role of extra regional partners playing and, and allies playing in a federated approach in the Middle East going forward, both in terms of developing capabilities as well as approaches to force posture. Okay, and by extra regional allies, I mean UK, France, Australia. Right, and I would I just broaden that out a little. I know, for instance, on countermine, we have some Asian um, allies who have participated, and if you're willing to go this far, if you could talk a little bit about the role of China, who certainly, which certainly has an, 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 an interest in security in the Gulf. So let me start with Matt. Sure, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, is, is we're, to the extent possible, we try to build a broader coalition. I mean, I think, Kath, as you mentioned, for the international non countermeasure uh, exercise, it would be 42 nations participating. So there's an important role for the UK, France, but also, Again, if you take something like the Strait of Pramuts, it's a collective security issue that China benefits as well and also has an interest. So I think what we try to do there is bring as many countries together to make the point that a disruption of commerce there is something that, uh, that uh, uh, impacts us all. There's nothing we can both do ourselves. Um, I think as far as the other partners there is, we have a set of pretty intensive conversations with the with the British and with the, uh, with the French or other European partners about what we can do in a sense. Now, of course, there are going to be some times which we're facing competition over particular weapon sales issues, uh, and that's just the nature of what you have when you have countries with very high quality uh, material. But I think the bigger thing that we try to do is find ways to make sure that we're looking at ways together so the things that they're doing can allow for the type of interoperability that we need with them as well. And the final piece I'd just say is one thing that we started doing, which doesn't get as much attention, is to add talking about the Middle East with other regional partners. So it's well known that the Middle East is talked about with NATO partners. Syria and ISIL and Iraq was a key part of the summit agenda at Wales. But also these are conversations we have with our Asian partners, with other ones, because as we're all doing things together, it's better to start that conversation and understand how we see various pieces together, which I think is something, frankly, we need to accelerate and do a lot more uh, in the future. Tom, do you have any thoughts on this too? Uh, and I think the, both Matt and Chris have, have mentioned the uh, extraordinary competitiveness in the international market, and so we, you know, that's from a from a U.S. industrial base perspective, we face that every day. So, uh, you know, from my view, my vantage point, uh, U.S. advocacy for uh, transfer of technology, enabling them with uh, with our equipment, is is a key aspect of it. Now, does it always, you know, turn out that way? Uh, they do, you know, the each each nation does, you know, buy equipment that they, they think they need. The, the advantage though, you know, and I'm going to call it the, the U.S. government seal of, of approval on it, you get it for a long time and you get the whole tale that goes with it, everything from training to sustainment to uh, a long-term relationship. Um, fortunately, many of our other uh, competitors in the international market aren't necessarily there as long or can provide as uh, sustained uh, uh, support and, and the, so the bilateral relationship that goes along with a, a U.S. procurement is, is essential. And uh, the other aspect I think that uh, is key to it is our ability to help industrialize, again, if, it's, if that's in their nation's interest, with uh, capacity beyond just the transfer of the equipment. You know, it's, you know, developing factories, developing technologies, you know, working with their universities. You know, we, 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 we help in the background of uh, university uni university relationships, you know, universities that are in Saudi, for example, with, here, with, uh, with uh, teaching institutes here in, in the United States. Like I said before, they have 100,000 students here in the United States. You know, we should be leveraging that relationship. Thanks very much. Other questions? Stunningly complacent crowd. Let me add my own then. I have plenty more. Um, Chris, you, you started to touch on a train of questioning that I will pursue, and let me go directly to unmanned systems. And um, I think that's an area where we've seen on the part of Congress or some members of Congress, maybe more fairly said, this concern about um, letting U.S. technology into the region when we can't control, you know, its end use 
Um, can you talk a little more about the areas, whether it's unmanned or others, that you think Congress is particularly sensitive to in terms of either capability types, um, specific, you know, system areas, um, or other things that you hear as concerns from members in terms of sharing of technology? Sure. I mean, I think the, um, you know, the example you mentioned on, on unmanned systems, you know, kind of comes back to the question that she asked, which is, uh, this this kind of dynamic or debate of, well, if we don't provide it, will someone else fill that gap? Are we better or worse off as a result of that? Um, you know, I think the unmanned system has really, uh, you know, the PREDEX, for example, I mean, those are things that have really focused the minds of people in Congress, even, you know, I think outside of the committees of jurisdiction, um, because it would appear to uh, make it easier for countries to take the kinds of action um, that members of Congress would be uh, concerned about them taking. Um, and to the extent we're sort of emboldening that or, or, or furthering that trend, uh, that's something that I think is kind of warranted specific scrutiny from the Congress. But again, I mean, I think you, you very quickly run into the pressure of um, increasingly even in the unmanned systems market. You know, there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of countries that are eager to fill that void uh, and will do that um, less scrupulously than the United States of America will. Um, you know, so the argument that you very quickly run into is, well, uh, are we better off providing uh, an armed, unmanned system to country X um, ourselves with, you know, the sustainment and the peace that comes along the tail and all of that, uh, as well as the influence, diplomatic and otherwise, that it provides us uh, into, into, into sort of how it's being and will be used, again, limited though that may be, um, or are we just going to assume that if the United States government says no, they'll take no for an answer and they won't go seek that capability from someone else who will have uh, far fewer restrictions on how it's ultimately used. Matt, can you talk a little bit about the congressional relations approach that you all are taking in terms of identity? You'd mentioned earlier about not having big surprises at the end of the FMS process. Part of that, of course, is <clears throat> working closely with Congress. Can you talk a little bit about your approach to doing so inside the administration? Sure. I mean, I think I think there are two. I think there are two parts that that goes along. I mean, of course, is the formal approval process, which is prescribed by number of days and notifications, and we keep that. But I think increasingly, I thought we try to do is just do even more informal conversations, yeah. which I think makes a difference. And especially, there's a huge amount of information. I think, frankly, that we get through congressional delegations, and staff delegations coming out about what's really important. And also, as we, as we look at things, as Chris said, also to explain when we see uh, competitive sales, too. I mean, to go through and say, we, we want the United States to be the defense provider of choice. Uh, now, this means working with partners and not the United States bearing the cost of it. But we want, we think our, our equipment is superior, our technology is better, and it has all these, these goals. And I think for things that we can do together on that informal level, that's, that's something that we've, we've tried to do. As Chris said, there's a... There are specific committees of jurisdiction that it's relevant for, but I think it's also a broader conversation with other folks, with members who are looking at what is going on here, why are we shouldering the burden, and what concrete are we doing to make sure that we're not going it alone, which, which I think is a big part of the conversation now. I'm sorry, Matt, I'm going to pick on you by asking you a different question, um, <clears throat> and that's about um, posturing. We've talked a lot about capabilities in terms of equipment. But there's also capabilities, as you all have said, in terms of interoperability, working together, um, maybe shared logistics capabilities, other like that. We have uh, locations already in the, in the um, region, particularly in the Gulf, where we're co-located. Do you think there's an ability to build on those sorts of assets or facilities in the future? Uh, to create more collective approaches, maybe you know trilateral or multilateral um, arrangements um, that start to weave people together more closely. Yeah, I, I think there is, and I think that's a great. Uh, I think that's a great point. I mean, when we talk about part, I mean, there's sort of three parts of what we're trying to do in a sense. There's there are partnerships, uh, but there's also the posture and U.S. military presence in the region in our planning that we engage in, and I think for. For all the talk of, this was often before the ISIL discussions about sort of the U.S. focus on being a Pacific power, I think it was easy to ignore the significant presence the United States had just sheer posture-wise in the Gulf. I mean, the United States has over 35,000 military personnel in the Gulf. You know, that includes over 10,000 four deployed soldiers who have attack helicopter, heavy armor, 
equipment. We have some of our most advanced ISR, radar, and fighter capability. You know, we have over 40 ships in the region with the 5th Fleet headquartered there. There is a lot of sheer hard power that the United States still maintains in that region right now. And, and I think that's necessary, which both shows America's commitment to evolving threats in the region. And that has not tamed or decreased as a result of sort of the different negotiations that are going on and things like that. So I think what we need to do is sort of make clear that the United States is fully committed. And the sign of our commitment, part of it, is the enormous amount of funds we still spend and the American service members who are serving in this very complicated and threatened region often. And I think to use that to build on what you're talking about are, well, how then can we think about using this posture most effectively to deploy in a cost-effective way to changing situations, to do it with countries uh, that they're comfortable with, the various posture that we would have, and also to think about how do you sort of redeploy it. But, uh, and when I say I don't mean redeploying it from the region, but think about what is the appropriate mix of capabilities that we have. But I think the starting point for that conversation really needs to be an understanding of here's what we have and here's America's skin in the game. Because I think when there's sometimes talk about finding creative approaches, it's wrongly thought of as a lessening of commitment. Uh, and it really isn't. It really is thinking about how we can think creatively and evolve what we're looking at, given the different relations we have with these countries and different new opportunities, frankly, to build on it more. Okay, we have a couple questions over here. Let's start right here. Oh, oh, that's fine. We'll go in. We'll go in order. Thanks, uh, Tom Goffis from the Senate Armed Services Committee. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit as a panel about uh, the challenges associated with uh, a phased adaptive approach for uh, Gulf missile defense, and the similarities and differences that uh, might occur between that and what we've done in Europe. Who would like to start on that? You, you can you take it on? Okay. Sure. I mean, I think, look, I think at a, uh, I mean, I think at a high level, I, I would just say just on the broader question of, of air and missile defense, I think that that has been, I think one of the most fruitful parts of this ongoing conversation that, that we've had. Um, I mean, at, at the policy level is there have been a few things driving towards it. I think the recognition of the shared threat, you know, the interest in American equipment, but also very practical things. Uh, take, for example, for the Combined Air Operations Center. Uh, the there are liaison officers sitting uh, most every day with the GCC states, with Americans, looking at a common air picture right now. You know, we have uh, the head of our uh, Air Force and CENTCOM doing real and meaningful diplomacy with his counterparts to do that. So I think at the policy level, as we think of that, I, I'll let Tom talk about some of the operational and interoperability issues. There's a good framework to think about what we can do. Now, there's more work to be done, but I think as far as an issue that rises to very senior levels of the agenda, this is really one of them. So there's no technical reason why, why it can't be applied in the Gulf. Um, actually, you know, so especially with many of the Gulf states buying uh, similar equipment that's either deployed in the phase adaptive approach or, or uh, significant elements to it. Uh, again, whether it's uh, long range radars or engagement systems, a Patriot THAAD, you know, a whole host of, uh, of capabilities, including the maritime uh, aspect in, in the P PAA as well. Um, right now, um, the U.S. Enjoy, enjoys the position of being the uh, center point for integration of all those capabilities. Uh, Matt had mentioned uh, at the uh, Combined Air Center, it's the same thing for the maritime um, emphasis, you know, on whether it's on, on one of the four deployed carriers or not. So the U.S. now, essentially through their bilateral arrangements, uh, providing capability uh, and interoperability, uh, but there's no reason why that can't be shared uh, across GCC countries should they decide that's in their best interest to do it. There's no technical reason uh, to prevent that. Mike. Thank you. Mike Minahan with Lockheed Martin. Um, I was wondering if the panel could comment on, um, I think it was Tom that referred to U.S. government advocacy for foreign military sales. Um, and, 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 you know, you have a situation where there's been some um, pretty significant uh, uh, examples of, uh, particularly with our European allies, 
um, where they've you know shamelessly sent foreign minister or you know ministers at, uh, uh, exclusively to the to the Middle East to plug their systems, um, and and so you've got that 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 d dynamic, and and at the same time you've got the example or, or the situation where uh, you know our technology edge is sort of eroding. And so you've got the convergence, I think, of those two uh, dynamics where it, I think it makes it increasingly difficult uh, for, for U.S. industry to compete in, in the region. Um, I'd just be interested in the, in the panel's comments on, on U.S. government advocacy to, to try to uh, you know, fight against that so that you know, U.S. industry can maintain those decades-long uh, relationships that come with uh, the sales of, of our systems and the, the training that goes with it, the education. Thank you. Well, let's start with Tom. Is there more that you wish uh, were happening to help you guys out? Uh, I, I think Matt um, framed it well in the fact of the continuing dialogue and, and the importance of that, you know, even at the early stages of the, you know, the formulation and we're going to say the marketing approach, right, to make sure that the, we from an industry perspective are aligned with the U.S. government objectives and vice versa, right, to make sure that we've got got good communications and that we're, you know, we're sharing information. Um, you know, we, we get different perspectives when we go into country, so we make a point of it to, to feedback, you know, what we're hearing, what we're picking up, and, and, uh, and both on, at state and, and, uh, and defense to do the same thing. And we, we work obviously very closely with, with the Hill, you know, because they're a key part of it, and, and we get a lot of information from them on, on CODELs and staff DELs as well. I, I think what, one of the things that we could, um, Maybe, maybe be more efficient and effective on is is alignment of uh, of the planning and the and the and at the policy level to ensure that that actually gets flowed down all the way through the implementing agencies. Right. So it's not unusual for us to uh, to run into uh, challenges, for example, that might be aligned at the policy level, but at the implementing level, you know, you don't always get the uh, forward motion and the timeliness that you would 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 look for. And, and from an industry perspective, I mean, that's one of our metrics is, is our ability to be predictable and, and, you know, when we're going to, you know, make sales happen and, the, and those kinds of things. So I think uh, if one of the key areas that we could work on would be, would be to ensure that alignment within the government and, and, and the execution agencies. Chris, do you have a perspective on grading uh, how well the administration is doing in terms of supporting U.S., the U.S. defense industrial base? Uh, sure. No, I mean, look, I think, uh, you know, as, as the amount of these sales sort of testify to themselves, you know, they're, they're doing quite well. Um, what I would say is I think, you know, Congress actually does have uh, a role to play in this as well. I mean, there's a lot of congressional travel. There's a lot of congressional staff travel. Um, you know, Senator McCain has been an advocate for American defense uh, companies, particular contracts, you know, as we've traveled throughout the region. Um, you know, I think that the uh, you know, it's, it's advocacy on the back end when you actually have a pending sale or a competition. Um, you know, I think the, the, the idea that we're sort of pursuing here of a more federated approach um, would sort of lead to more advocacy on the front end in terms of, you know, as Tom kind of mentioned, the sort of uh, the strategy and planning of not just sort of sitting down at the end and saying, you know, look, you country X want to acquire the following capability. We really would encourage you to buy American. Uh, but engaging them on the front end, you know, as, as I think is being done to a large degree about, look, let's really work through the scientific method here. You know, what are your challenges? What kinds of capabilities do you need? What kinds of capabilities uh, are extraneous? And, you know, here's why we believe, you know, what the United States offers is far, uh, far exceeds uh, the particular hardware that you will be acquiring. But, you know, the sort of the broad partnership that I think all of us are in agreement um, you know, is, is most responsive to these countries' challenges. And that's something that, uh, you know, I think Congress can play a role in as uh, members of Congress travel through the region, which they're increasingly doing. Okay, and we had one more question back here. Uh, Pete Doty, CSIS. I, I was, uh, as a follow-up to the comments on U.S. skin in the game, how would you characterize what our GCC or other Middle East partners are expressing as the risks to that long-term mill-to-mill relationship due to our decreasing defense budgets and force structure? Jump ball on that? Any thoughts? <laughs> I, mean, I, I can, I can I'm, I'm frankly interested in Tom, what you're also hearing from folks, but just to, just to come in, and I think, 
I think the concern was was less about uh, th that I heard at least you know less about the uh, defense budgets in a sense and more about you know thinking like what is what is the nature of American presence in the region after ground wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and as we think about focuses on the uh, on the Asia Pacific and I think but at the same time with that and think our answer was was as I said I mean the United States commitment remains strong I think as I look at things from within the Defense Department there is not any lessened commitment we're looking to try to do things smarter to address the security challenges but it's not a sense that the United States has less of a commitment to to our security interests there what I hear uh, from my side of things still though is that the interest in the security partnership with the United States has not been diminished. I mean, there's a lot more public attention on it with the coalition towards ISIL, which we've been working very intensively to build over the last few weeks. But it's been a constant theme that there's a demand for uh, American involvement. I mean, I think in a thirst for American leadership here, which we're trying to make sure that we're still well postured to answer. I mean, if I, if I could just add to that, I mean, I think the prior to the, the uh, start of the ISIL campaign. I mean, the concern was not so much one of uh, capability coming from the region. I mean, the question was more judgment and resolve. Um, and I think certainly something that we hear, and we travel extensively through the region and sort of serve as the, um, I don't know, the, the sounding board for partners to sort of express their frustrations about uh, U.S. role, U.S. involvement, et cetera. Uh, but certainly prior to this, I mean, there was a huge hunger for greater American involvement, a perception that uh, not just the administration, but the country at large just wanted nothing to do with the region anymore. There was total Middle East fatigue. Uh, so it wasn't so much a concern about the capability. I mean, I think as Matt correctly alluded, I mean, you look around the region, there's a lot of military capability that's there. Uh, the concern was whether uh, the resolve was there behind it to address the problems that were emerging. And, you know, hopefully we'll see what's going on now vis-a-vis -vis ISIL as an inflection point um, that will lead to sort of a different, uh, you know, response from the administration. Um, I think that just kind of remains to be seen and how our Middle Eastern partners kind of respond to that, you know, also remains to be seen. My sense, and I'm in the region quite a bit, um, and my sense is, is not so much about U.S. commitment. It's, it's more about uh, their self-interest in, in, in self-sufficiency. So I think what, what I've seen is uh, their interest in investing in, in capabilities and technologies that, that they really are looking for, uh, you know, more self-reliance, but clearly with the uh, objective of interoperability and, and, and shared capability with the United States, I mean, which is why the significant interest in, in U.S. capabilities there. And, uh, and, it, and it's just strengthened, really, with, with uh, U.S. government advocacy from that, from that perspective. There is a lot of respect for the U.S. military force, you know, in, that you see, you know, in the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, our, our end users, so to speak, in, in, um, in, especially in the GCC countries. So uh, I, I don't see any waning from that perspective at all. Okay, and one last question back here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Robert Hunter at the uh, Center for Transatlantic Relations. Uh, given the common interest there is in fighting extremism, et cetera. Does the panel see any chance in the future of a regional security system that would include all of the state actors, uh, including uh, Iran, or is that ruled out? What are the prospects for a NATO-like architecture to include Iran? I mean, I, I think uh, I, I think that's many, 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 many steps away from where we are right now. I mean, I think the thing I would say is just if you look at where where we are, I think even just the last three weeks, I think there's something I think pretty significant happening. You know, I think if our strategy uh, to counter uh, extremism and ISIL has been built around building an international coalition and empowering some local partners. I think it's significant that you had uh, statements from these governments about their pilots flying with U.S. air operations, both the Emiratis and the Saudis and then other GCC partners. That's, that's very significant. That's a real concrete uh, mode of participation, a way that we're actually striking these targets together. I think it's very significant that as we are looking to have a program to train and equip uh, a moderate Syrian opposition, that Saudi Arabia has publicly talked about their willingness to host. Uh, part of this training mission, and that you have 
uh, a next planning team in Saudi Arabia working on this. So I think from where we sit, and even the last thing I'd say is, even if you look at the last strategic cooperation forum, the communique that came out of this meeting really had teeth. I mean, really talked about something shared, which I think is a step forward from where you've seen before. So I think on working for an architecture amongst our Gulf and other partners in, in the region, uh, with also the Jordanians and the Egyptians and the Lebanese, and there is momentum to do something more. I think what you've learned in the evolution of cooperation in this area is that it is slow and steady, and overall you need to be patient, because I think we're dealing much like with the United States with sovereign nations which have capabilities and see common threats, but I think we need to start with areas that we can move uh, where we concretely need each other in the near term, and I think that's where we are. I think we should focus on what's possible now and continue to build on it, and I think taking large steps in the future, I think what might be possible is that's, I think that's still, uh, that's still a, ways, uh, a ways, a ways away. I think it's what you're talking about in your question about Iran, there's no contemplation of something like that as part of our policy. Okay, I'm going to make a few administrative comments before I thank the panel. <clears throat> we have lunch outside for you to serve yourselves, and then you can come back in here to eat. So we'll have a little break for you to, to eat some, and then we'll have um, Phil Gordon joining uh, to give his talk, at, uh, hopefully, at, at noon. Um, so let me just end this session by saying thank you to this incredible panel of uh, folks who brought all the various stakeholders, other than the regional voice itself, to the table. Um, and we look forward in our study over the next six months to digging deeper into these issues that you raised. So thank you.